What a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I should start by introducing my co-panelists. Um, do you want to, want to come up? Um, so delighted to be joined today by two real experts and pretty inspirational figures in this field working on this issue, which I'll start with Elizabeth Woodward, who is the producer of an award-winning film, um, uh, Another Body, um, which follows the uh, story of a victim of non-consensual deep play pornography fighting for justice. Um, Elizabeth also co-founded the uh, My Image, My Choice campaign, um, which uh, works to try and uh, get governments to remove websites that share non-consensual deepfake pornography. I'm also delighted to be joined by uh, Rebecca Fortnoy, um, who is the head of data science at Thorn, uh, which is a non-profit uh, dedicated to building technological solutions to fight uh, CSAM content, child sexual abuse material. Um, so thank you both so much for joining. Um, I was really, really glad to be invited to moderate this session um, on a topic which is uncomfortable, and parts of this conversation may well be uncomfortable with good reason. Um, we talk a lot in this space about deepfakes in the context of disinformation, cybersecurity, even market manipulation, and these topics get a lot of airtime, and they get a lot of people worried. But an area that comes up, but maybe not as much as I would like to hear, is arguably still the biggest harm, affects the most victims, and that is non-consensual deepfake pornography targeting both adults and children. Um, research I did back in 2018-2019 period found 96% of deepfake, uh, deepfakes online at the time were non-consensual pornography, and this problem has not got better since. We're talking about a huge scaling of this problem as the tools have become much more easy to use um, and much more awareness has grown around them. So really glad that today we're going to get to talk about this problem and what role, if any, prominence has in, in, in combating it. Um, but I guess to start, I'd love to ask you both how you became involved in this space. What motivated you to kind of tackle this really large problem? Elizabeth, if you'd like to start. Yeah, so um, I'm originally a film producer, and we started making this film about deepfake porn directed by Sophie Compton and Ruben Hamlin. And the thought was to try and you know, find someone's story who was experiencing this problem, because as Henry said, the media was talking a lot about the kind of theoretical possible harms of deepfakes in the arenas of politics and you know, other parts of society, but what was really happening is that millions of women were being deepfaked online. So we met Taylor, who is a college student and who was sent a link with six deepfake porn videos of herself, and we follow her journey for justice. And part of the process of making this film was, you know, meeting survivors, and we realized that there's so much shame around this issue and so much um, silencing that those voices weren't being heard in uh, policy, government, academic, and media spaces. So we founded My Image, My Choice to be kind of the bridge for that. Fantastic. Uh, Henry, to answer your question, I have to go all the way back to my senior year of college. Uh, so when I was an undergraduate studying computer science, um, like a lot of kids at the time, I was trying to figure out what to do next with my life. Uh, should I go to grad school? Should I get an industry job? Sort of independent of that decision, my older sister happened to recommend to me a book called Half the Sky, which some of you may have read. It's written by Nicholas Kristof and, um, and his wife. And there's a, a section of that book that is dedicated to uh, child sexual abuse and child sex trafficking. Um, I couldn't shake this from my mind, I, and so I spent some time thinking about it and uh, praying about it and figured that if I were going to use my skills to help tackle this problem, I, I would probably have an easier time in grad school figuring out the how of doing that. So I, Went to uh, Berkeley. It's great to be back in the, the Bay Area to, um, to try to answer that question. I spent a couple of years cold calling anybody who would talk to me, any NGOs, any law enforcement officers, uh, asking them this question, what can technology do to help you in your work? And through that process, I got I introduced to Thorne, my current employer. Um, and uh, when I finished my degree, I, I said, are you guys hiring? Because I don't really want to work anywhere else. And thankfully, they said yes. Well, I'm very glad they did. <laughs> um, I think you know one thing that cuts across this whole space is once you learn about these problems and the scale of them, it's really hard to, as you said, get them out of your head. Um, and I guess on that note, you know, deepfakes and uh, non-consensual deepfake uh, pornography, you know, has really exploded over the last six years since it first emerged in late 2017. Um, but it can often be hard to get a sense of the scale and the impact of these technologies, um, how women, children are being impacted. Um, and I guess I really wanted to ask, you know, what does the landscape look like? Why is this such a big problem, and, and you know, how is this impacting um, children and women every day? Elizabeth, I don't know if you wanted to. 
Yeah, I mean, what we learned from Taylor's story is that you know there are a host, there's over 9,000 websites that are specifically dedicated to intimate image abuse. And then there's also places like 4chan, which are message boards where this takes place. And the tools that are being used to make this type of content are not you know closed source. They're using open source models. Um, and there's a whole culture and community and even like a small industry that's bubbling up around it. There are creators who do commissions, who have assistants now. There's message boards where people exchange notes, who talk about like their copyright style of deep faking, not mentioning at any point that they're stealing women's likenesses and making non-consensual pornography of them. Um, so it's, it's really exploding and um, it's been really interesting to see you know, in terms of the policy and government spaces or regulatory frameworks, there's such a lack of people coming forward talking about the fact that this is happening to them, that there's maybe a sense that, you know, politicians, constituents are not affected by this. Um, so, yeah, it's been amazing to see kind of the power of our group of testimonies, at least, were shared with the World Economic Forum, the UK Law Commission, and with the White House, um, with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. and because of Taylor, who's in the film story, the executive order on AI has a paragraph specifically about deepfake porn, and she was the only survivor of deepfake porn that they had spoken to. So it's an exploding problem. There's not that many people talking about it, but you know, the one voice can make a difference. Absolutely. Rebecca. Yeah, I think I'll start by framing it in the broader problem of child sexual abuse material in general. So last year in 2022, um, According to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, which is the clearinghouse for these kinds of reports, they received over 88 million potential files of child sexual abuse from online platforms. That's 88 million. So if you think about that kind of scale, anything that adds to that incredible haystack of content is a problem. So then now we have misuse of generative AI emerging, where we're seeing bad actors are using broadly shared and open source models to produce more of this content. Some of it is bespoke to specific children, as in they will fine tune these models on existing abuse material in order to create more content of those same kids who have already been through something so egregious and terrible to create more content of those same kids but in new poses and new sexual acts. And I know that this is graphic and difficult to hear, but I just wanna hammer home that this is the, the scale of the problem that we're dealing with, that we have impact in, uh, in huge numbers and then also very personal impact in individual kids' lives. Mm. Absolutely, um, and, and it is graphic and it is difficult to hear, but it's, it's incredibly important. I mean, from, from my work in this space, I also work with the Law Commission in the UK um, on these issues, um, as well as in the EU context. Um, and one of the things for me that I find really worrying when talking about this issue is, is you know, the different places where this can happen as well. It's not just necessarily for the you know, sexual gratification of the person creating it. It can also be to, to bully, to harm, to defame. Um, one of the areas I was really worried about when I first started researching in this space was schools, because kids can do some really horrible things. Um, and um, recently we've seen this emerging more and more in the schools context, um, other you know, uh, students targeting other students. Um, and I do these kinds of talks quite often, and at least every time that there are young adults in the room, I will get normally at least one person coming up and saying, thank you for raising this, my friend was targeted, I know someone, my sister. Um, so it really could be you know, anyone. Um, any woman is now a potential victim, which is a really scary position to be in. Um, and the techniques are changing as well, of course. Right? It's the deep, new, nudifying images, it's face swapping, it's lots of different techniques. Um, so we have a really, really big challenge, um, really startling challenge, um, which I guess brings me to provenance, which is the focus of today's um, whole session with the CAI and the amazing work that's going on here. Um, but Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, you know, some people might think, well, okay, no one's going to want to put content credentials on their, you know, intimate imagery that they're sending to partners. So this isn't relevant. But there are ways that we think potentially provenance might be able to have a positive impact here. I was wondering if you could maybe explain how you see that potentially fitting in. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a, a real opportunity here for provenance to help this already overtaxed system. So I talked about 88 million files. I, when it comes to prioritization and triage of that kind of content, you have victim identification work where you want to be able to rapidly find in that content a child that's in active harm's way, but you also wanna be able to find content that shows a child that 
maybe isn't currently in active harm's way, but was in active harm's way, as there's re-victimization that comes from the sharing of this material. So in general, being able to reliably distinguish between an image that was completely uh, falsified or an image that was slightly altered in a particular way or an image that um, uh, is you know, completely authentic, that all of this is really valuable intelligence downstream for folks who are on the ground doing victim identification work. And so what I am really eager to see is content provenance solutions that happen not as a post-processing step, but as something that's baked into the image generation process. Because right now, a bad actor, especially in the open source setting, they're gonna just kind of pluck out whichever part of the, the tech stack I, tracks that kind of provenance. And so being able to come up with robust solutions that take into account that bad actor perspective and make it such that uh, it's much more difficult for, uh, for downstream for them to pull this out from the, the tech stack is something that I'm really keen to see. And I honestly would look to this community to help come up with those types of creative and necessary solutions. Yeah, really interesting. I think we might come on to in a little bit some of the kind of the ways this works with open source perhaps is challenging in the open source context. And as, as you know, Elizabeth, this is uh, open source is a space where quite a lot of this harm has kind of emerged um, with the tools that are being used. Um, so I guess one way I often look at the kind of the harms that are being caused, as, as I mentioned before, was this idea of a perverse customer journey. If you think about it from the sense of the intention to do something to the harm being caused, there are lots of different steps along that process. Um, and some of them provenance might be able to fit in, as you just mentioned, Rebecca. But Elizabeth, I wonder what other steps on that journey do you see as really critical to the harm actually being caused, actually being actualized? Yeah, so what we've been focused on in terms of, you know, the next phase of our campaign and activism work is, you know, Henry has this amazing term of the perverse user journey and figuring out how to disrupt that, but there's kind of three things that would really help. And one is, you know, Google plays a role as like a gatekeeper or the access point for a lot of people who are looking for these websites. You know, they appear on the search results. If you search how to make a deep fake of my girlfriend, you will be served with tutorials and websites where you can order these sites. So the kind of process of de-indexing would have a huge impact in terms of just making it more difficult to access these spaces. The other is internet service providers blocking these websites. There was a period during our research where Verizon had blocked Mr. Deepfakes for like a month and then it went back on. I don't know what happened there, but that would be you know really great if that could happen. And then also payment processors. You know, there's ways to block access to those services like Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal that are being used on some of these websites. Um, and it feels like those are things that could really make a difference. Absolutely. I think, if, and, and Rebecca, I'm sure you know better than me, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the moves that actually got rid of a lot of content on um, some of the major pornography platforms um, was actually the payment providers pulling out because of um, CSAM content. And that, the, the, the kind of upshot of them cracking down on the platform was a lot of other different harmful content was removed at the same time, which was, I guess, a net positive. It's still a lot of work to be done. Um, in terms of the kind of, I guess, the companies that are developing these tools, you've already touched on the fact you'd like to see this kind of baked in. Um, I'm curious, when it comes to the open versus closed debate around the ways that tools are developed, Rebecca, do you see kind of a, a meaningful distinction about how provenance could work in those contexts? And what are the unique challenges that might come with a more open approach, say, compared to a more closed approach? You know, I think one thing that I'll stress is um, I, don't, I don't like the, the binary of, you know, open source is good or bad, you have to pick. I think that uh, I've got some folks who are on my team here today, and they, they know that this is true, that we build off of the shoulders of giants, that there is a deep, rich, and positive history of open source specifically in machine learning and AI. And we benefit from that in the type of tools that we build to help accelerate victim identification and stop re-victimization. And so to me, this is a, uh, not a binary good or bad, it's about responsible development. What does it look like, regardless of whether or not you are open sourcing or closed sourcing your tools, to be a responsible developer? And to your point, Henry, the risks are different depending on how you choose to uh, deploy and share your tools, but the uh, the uh, capacity to be responsible, the uh, options that exist for you are still present. So we talk a lot about safety by design in our space and what that looks like, and in particular for machine learning AI, I see a lot of opportunity across the entire life cycle of develop, deploy, and maintain, both for open and closed source, to think about 
how to prioritize child safety in each of those stages. And you know, content provenance is definitely one of the important ones, but there's a, a lot of other opportunities that I see uh, that can be enacted at the AI developer stage, the AI provider stage, all up and down the tech stack. Sure. And also just to add the, the kind of difference, I guess, between CSAM and deep fake porn when it's you know, not children is that there's no law there's a federal law right now that says that making deep fake porn of women is not okay. So, you know, just the kind of cultural standard of an accepted, shared, uh, like, social contract that this is not acceptable would also make a difference. Absolutely, and I'd, I'd love to hear more from your experience with My Image, My Choice, and the kind of the work you've been trying to do, you know, I guess lobbying governments, trying to get this to happen. How has that experience been? Has that been something which has been... Uh, you know, somewhat promising? Is that deeply frustrating? How is, how is the process been? Because I, I know from my experience advising governments on this, it's, it's not always easy, but I'm curious to hear, uh, Elizabeth, how, that, how that's been for you. Yeah, I mean, we're not experts or lawyers or professional policymakers, and our focus is really on bringing stories into those spaces to inform what's being discussed. Like when we got in touch with the Law Commission, they didn't have access, in the UK, they didn't have access to any survivor testimonies because they just had no idea how to meet or find these people or build the trust to speak with them. So the, I think what's been really exciting is to see how you know, lived experience experts and survivors, their stories can be listened to and kind of unlock understandings about like what these policies need to encompass in the first place. Um, and also what justice looks like in these situations. You know, is it a carceral model? Is it, what is the answer to this kind of larger social problem? And also when you hear people's stories, you realize that this is happening. You know, it, it's a sexual violence against women issue that is, you know, made worse by AI. It's not a technological issue at its core, and there's a lot of things that are being done to solve those issues. So to speak to the campus and mm. student piece, um, we're, do, we're screening the film and doing discussions, and we have a guide for students to ask their university departments of sexual assault uh, prevention and education and response to build on what they already do to address this. Um, so that gives me hope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that I always found really startling doing the kind of quite um, unpleasant, almost investigative journalism work, going into the forums where this content is shared, seeing the kinds of interactions that these people are having, is that a lot of these people just don't see this as sexual abuse. They see it as a bit of a meme, a bit of a joke, um, clearly not real, so how could you find this harmful? Um, and that's something that the education work that you're doing and, and the documentary provides is really important, but also the legal side of things, you know, um, people will find it much harder to dismiss something as a joke if it's very clear to them that they are effectively committing digital sexual assault. Um, but I guess this leads to another question around the legislative side of things, which is, um, Rebecca, I'm sure you're very familiar, obviously CSAM is, is highly legislated against, um, very, very clearly a, a, a real harm, but enforcement is a whole other question. You're right, you can have very strong policies and very strong legislation, but actually being on top of the issue is a whole other question. I'm curious, in your experience, you know, how, how have we seen legislation actually change things, or does it actually change things significantly? Do we need stronger legislation because of the AI-enabled abuse that we're seeing? Um, do you think that would have a meaningful impact on the amount of content that we're seeing being shared? I'm also not a policy person. I'm a practitioner, so I, I, just, I come from that perspective. I will say that um, I, from what I am seeing, I, this type of impact requires a collaboration and action across the board, whether or not you're talking about regulation or with technology platforms or with developers that uh, really having impact on this space, it's, it's such a pervasive global problem that it requires a global response. So if there's one particular legislative change that I would like to, to see, it would be around um, consistency. I think that because this is a global crime, I, it requires collaboration across borders, and that can be hard if the uh, regulatory landscape is not the same across borders. Mm, for sure, certainly, and certainly something that we've seen even just in the UK between, say, Scotland and England and Wales, slightly different terminology and, and laws have made very different problems when it comes to enforcement uh, around AI image abuse. Um, I really want to touch on the fact that, you know, we mentioned we heard Dana say this at the beginning of the day, um, you know, provenance isn't a silver bullet. Um, and I don't think any of us here would, would want to pretend that provenance is the only solution approach as we've just been talking about legislation, for example. Um, I'm curious what you think, Rebecca, you know, provenance can't do. 
what, what is it that, you know, what are the limits of prominence in this space? Um, and what are the supplementary, perhaps technological approaches or other approaches that you see? And Elizabeth, if you want to jump in as well, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I mentioned develop, deploy, maintain, and how there are opportunities across all three. I think maybe to just try to be a little bit more concise, um, developing these models in such a way that it's by default more difficult for them to produce this kind of content. That's something that I don't think content provenance can help with in this space. That is more about sort of how effectively are you cleaning your training data sets? What type of red teaming practices do you have? Um, what does it look like? What's your collaboration uh, downstream with AI providers? Are you assessing models before they've been shared onto platforms to understand their propensity to create this kind of content? Because you can have models that were trained specifically for this purpose to produce child sexual abuse material. And then you can have models that weren't trained for this purpose, but because of the nature of their data sets, still produce this kind of content. So those are all still real problems that do have uh, mitigations. I think that's the, the word that I land on. I, no silver bullets even in this case, but there are absolutely mitigations that can be implemented in order to uh, reduce the uh, propensity of these models to be misused in this way. Absolutely. Um, I think we've seen some, uh, some organizations, uh, Civit AI is, is one, um, and, um, and uh, Stability is another where we've seen real problems with this, partially because of the openness of the model, but also because you know, that it doesn't seem to necessarily be within those organizations, at least at the moment, a kind of a critical will to kind of really you know, exercise that, that material from the training data, um, which, is, which is deeply concerning, causing some real issues. Um, I guess, Elizabeth, from where, you're, from where you're standing, from where you're looking at this space, um, do you think that there's a particular issue here for, I guess, young men um, and the attitudes that they have? Do you feel like, you know, this is something which is, obviously it's not exclusively a gendered harm, it can be used on men in certain contexts, but it's overwhelmingly targeting women. Do you think this is something which has a kind of a real need for a societal shift around how we view kind of digital harms and, and, uh, and, and gen attitude, uh, attitudes to gender? So. Yeah, of course. Um, I think it's really a primary area that needs attention and it is also related to just like radicalization online. Like these spaces where, as you said earlier, you know, they're, they're, the entry point is not through like a kind of a serious crime or threat. Like it, you get into these message boards through jokes and there's kind of a sense of camaraderie and conversation and community that is very dangerous and also leads to other, you know, all the, different real life violences that we see all take place in these same spaces online. Um, and so, yeah, I think that what Dana was saying earlier about the importance of media literacy and also what everyone in this room can think about, you know, if it's not like a specifically technological solution because it's a bit, the provenance question is complicated when these images are being presented as not being authentic, like MrDeepfakes.com, which is the main website that has, I think it's 14 million hits a month, um, is not pretending to be real content. But there's so much that can be done to kind of educate the perpetrators or prevent them from becoming perpetrators in the first place. Because I think that most young people, especially young men who are engaging with this content don't realize that they're harming someone in the process and it kind of starts out first with content of celebrities and then there's the whole question of you know if you're a woman in the public arena are you automatic is it automatically accepted that you will be subjected to this kind of treatment but it's a very short um, journey to then be watching content of someone who's in your class and it's this kind of desensitization that's very akin to the like online radicalization journey yeah, absolutely. Um, from the research I did, there was a very clear shift from about 2019 to 2020 from celebrities to private individuals, and that came after a tool called Deep Nude went viral um, and was then re-implemented in various different forms, and uh, it was startling to see, you know, clearly people's uh, holiday photos, their Instagram photos being essentially uploaded to this model and, and, um, and changed. Um, I guess many people in this room are building, they're developing tools, they're passionate about provenance, they're passionate about trying to prevent the harms that you know, synthetic uh, media can cause. Um, do either of you know of any strong coalitions that are working, like the CAI is on provenance generally, on image abuse in this context with AI specifically? Or is this an area where we really need to try and build stronger kind of coalitions and maybe the CAI could play a role in, in helping to build that? Yeah, I think, well, 
My Image, My Choice is doing work. There's also the Reclaim Coalition, and Andrea is here uh, from there. And there's very there's a couple of other activist organizations, but I think the Content Authenticity Initiative has a, you know, there's so much that could be done in terms of the power of all of the companies and representatives that are in this room to influence policy or solutions or education. Um, and yeah, would definitely make a change. For me, the name of the game right now is collaboration. I think that there's a lot of really uh, deeply informed organizations like the Content Authenticity Initiative, like Thorn, like NCMEC, like all of these institutions that come with a very valuable and rich perspective about their focus. And as we see these technologies merge and mesh across the ecosystem in a way that just kind of infiltrates every aspect of our lives, I firmly believe that we need that rich perspective to be collaborating with each other, to understand where the gaps are that maybe I don't see, but you see because of your uh, spot in the universe and vice versa. That, that to me is where we really can have a lot of power. Mm. And there's also potentially interesting collaborations. Like I just remembered a activation that we did with Synthesia, who's a member of the CAI. Um, we allowed survivors who didn't want to share their face or voice publicly to type out their testimony, and then we use Synthesia's avatars to allow survivors to tell their story. Um, so I, you know, with the different technological solutions, if it's not fixing the problem, maybe there's a way of, you know, raising awareness or elevating uh, the kind of cultural conversation about this issue. For sure, and I think it's one of the really big challenges where you have technologies which are in some contexts pro-social, as you just mentioned. Sometimes they're creatively interesting, sometimes they're very commercially compelling, um, but they are dual-use technologies. Um, and uh, it's very, very hard to say, as, as some people in government have proposed when I've kind of raised these problems, well, ban it. It's like, well, okay, well, what, banning what? <laughs> you know, um, it's not particularly useful. So I think that education line and building those coalitions can really help preserve meaningful, positive use cases, and then also kind of help, help tackle some of the slightly more uh, pernicious ones. Um, I guess just to kind of round off, again, lots of people in this room who are in amazing positions, building incredible things, going back to their organizations maybe today or tomorrow um, with kind of thoughts about this conference. Um, for both of you, what is one thing you would like people here today to take away as their kind of like call to action that you would like them to go back to their organizations and say, this is what we can do or this is what we should be thinking about when it comes to intimate image abuse, um, particularly involving AI? Well, I'll, I'll let you go first. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, content provenance solutions in the open source setting with bad actors in mind. That is my very specific goal uh, for this conversation. I would love to, anybody who wants to come and say hi to me afterwards if you got interest in this topic, I welcome that. I, I see a real need for it. I do think that the minds that can answer that question are probably in this room. And I would love to be engaging with you on those kinds of solutions. Yeah, and we are really focused right now on speaking to Google and asking them to de-index these websites because we really feel like that is the most powerful thing that can happen right now and make a huge difference. So if anyone from Google is here, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> and if anyone knows anyone at Google, we're engaged in a conversation with their VP of Trust and Safety who's open to it, but it's really you know, working out how to make that shift. It would have a huge effect. Yeah, uh, a noble course. Um, yeah, I guess if I was to, to offer a, uh, my two cents on that as well, I guess. Um, these are really uncomfortable issues. They are issues that maybe um, you know, aren't the things that you necessarily want to be thinking about, and understandably so, um, on one level. But also, I think this is an opportunity to show that you know, when you're developing these tools, when you're developing generative technologies, that you are really in good faith taking into account the risks, but also showcasing the technologies and the creative solutions you can build for this may well actually have impact on other areas of your business um, in positive ways. Um, so I think, yes, get the conversation going internally in your organizations is what I would say. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people will be very grateful for that, including us. But I guess that's it from us. So thank you so much all for listening. And I believe we're gonna move to breakout rooms, but I think we might have a CAI person from Colleen coming to explain that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.